Hey, what is going on, guys? Clickwood here, back again, bringing you guys my 2018 NFL playoff prediction bracket. Uh, this is going to be a prediction for the entire playoffs this season. If you guys enjoy this video at any time, make sure that you drop a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Guys, we've got Super Bowl 52 this season in Minneapolis. The Vikings have a chance to play a home Super Bowl. Pretty awesome. Uh, but what we're going to do is start off in the AFC. And guys, before we get into this, I just want to point out this is for the 2018 playoffs. Keep that in mind. Yes, it is taking place in 2018. My video that I made last year was probably the most successful video that I ever had on this channel. Over 500,000 views, absolutely insane. Uh, and I think a lot of people toward the end started to get confused and they thought it was for next season, which was actually this season if you're watching it in 2018. Uh, but very, very confusing for some people. They just didn't realize that the playoff bracket was for last season. So be sure to pay attention to the year before you comment below, please. But with that said, let's get into it, guys. Buffalo Bills at Jacksonville Jaguars is going to be our first matchup that we're talking about here. Buffalo snuck into the playoffs, but let's be honest. On paper, this looks like a terrible matchup. Kelvin Benjamin isn't at 100%. Zay Jones looks awful. None of these receivers are capable of exploiting Jalen Ramsey and A.J. Boye. LaShawn McCoy is also injured. I mean, we think he's going to play, but this just does not look good at all. The Jaguars, in my opinion, should run away with this game, mostly by grinding the ball on the ground with Leonard Fournette. If you do have Leonard Fournette in a fantasy playoff league, I expect some big numbers in this one, probably over 100 yards and at least one touchdown. Jacksonville wins this one fairly easily, in my opinion, and this could be the end of the Tyrod Taylor era in Buffalo. We'll see what ends up happening as far as that goes, because Nathan Peterman looks awful. But let's go on to the other game on the other side of the AFC bracket here. We have Tennessee at Kansas City in the other wild card game. Now, none of these teams this weekend are particularly close uh, as far as the actual Vegas statistics go or what they're putting as far as the, um, the line goes. But the biggest point differential at the moment is actually Kansas City being favored by anywhere from eight to a full nine points at the various betting halls throughout the city. But Honestly, if there's going to be an up upset this weekend, I think it could be this one. Now, don't get me wrong. Tennessee is not a great team, and they arguably shouldn't even be in the playoffs if you consider that teams like the Chargers aren't in there. But they do have some quality wins this season, including two victories over the Jaguars, and one of them came this past week. Jacksonville and Kansas City aren't on exactly the same team, but they're not all that much different especially offensively. I mean, if you can slow down their running game, the Chiefs have, pro have proven that their quarterback is simply not capable of beating you. And I think that's pretty similar to what we saw Tennessee be able to do against Jacksonville. Um, the Chiefs throughout the season, especially in the middle of the season, got away from giving the ball to Kareem Hunt, and that hurt them. They lost a lot of games in the middle of the season. The Titans have one of the worst pass defenses in the NFL, but they're one of the best run defenses. So I think if they can shut down Kareem Hunt early in the game, look for Andy Reid to go away from the run and start to lean on Alex Smith, and if that happens, I think the Titans have a real shot to win this game outright, not just cover the spread. And uh, I'm really hoping that DeMarco Murray will actually sit out this game because Derrick Henry, despite a low yards per carry number against Jacksonville, is clearly the better, more dynamic player at this point. I do think the smart money is probably on Kansas City to win this game, but I just can't avoid thinking that there's going to be an upset this weekend, and I really think it could happen with the Titans beating the Chiefs. So I am going to take Tennessee, winning a very close game, which means that they will automatically move on as the five-seat seed to face the Patriots, while the Jaguars will move on to face the Steelers in the AFC. So moving over to the NFC, we have the Atlanta Falcons at the Los Angeles Rams. Very few NFL teams have ever gone from being the worst offense in the league to one of the best offenses in the league in just one season, but that's what we saw with the Rams this season. They brought in a new head coach in Sean McVay who completely changed the culture of the team, and that's why we're seeing them play a home field play uh, playoff game for the first time in many, many years. And, uh, I mean, they're playing it against the defending NFC champions. What's crazy is that the Falcons were the most efficient offense in the league just a season ago, 
but they took a big step in the wrong direction. They're still very good, but the explosiveness just doesn't seem to be there. The running game isn't as consistent. Julio Jones isn't beating teams deep as often. And, uh, you know, to me, if the Falcons are going to win this game, they're going to have to lean heavily on Julio Jones. Now, Julio is certainly capable of shouldering the load, and he's had some huge playoff games in the past, but I think he and Matt Ryan have had quite a few off games this season as well, so I just am not sure that the consistency is going to be there that is going to be needed in the playoffs. The positive for Atlanta is that while this game is being played in Los Angeles, the Rams really have not yet established any sort of a real home field advantage. The crowds are usually about 60-40 in favor of the home team, but it wouldn't be all that surprising to see more Falcons fans in attendance than Rams fans for this game. Still, the cross-country travel is brutal on a team at this point in the season. Atlanta all the way to Los Angeles. That's a pretty long travel if you really think about it. And the Falcons haven't been all that hot offensively down the stretch. Atlanta scored 24 or fewer points in five straight games to end the regular season. Meanwhile, the Rams have averaged nearly 30 points per game in their past five, and that includes a Week 17 game where they rested the majority of their offensive starters. I think this is going to be a high-scoring game, but I truly think it's Los Angeles' game to lose. If they can come out and score even close to at, to at their usual pace, I just don't think the Falcons are clicking enough to keep up, to be honest with you. And I, I do look for a nice game from Todd Gurley in this one, and I think the Rams are going to take it by about a touchdown. So the final wild card game will be Carolina at New Orleans. Two 11 and five teams squaring off for the third time this season. The Saints won the first two games by a score of 34 to 13 and 31 to 21. It's also worth noting that the Saints kind of took their foot off the pedal in the second game, as it was a three-score game with just a few minutes left to play, and Carolina got some garbage time points to make it look a little closer than it otherwise was. So it's easy to just say New Orleans beat them twice, so they'll beat them again. And, you know, it's hard to argue that. But I do think that might be true, and I think I am going to probably pick New Orleans in this game, but there just aren't that many teams that have more film on the Saints than the Panthers do. I mean, you play a team three times in one season, you're going to be well prepared. And uh, I don't look for this game to be another blowout by any means. The unfortunate thing is that Cam Newton just doesn't look right at the moment. And I don't foresee a situation where he's able to get the ball into the hands of his top receiver, Devin Funchess, who will likely be shadowed by the NFL's probable rookie of the year on defense, Marshawn Lattimore. Lattimore has been unbelievable this season, and Funchess was only able to catch four passes in each of the two games he played against the Saints this season. He really wasn't dominant in either of them, and Lattimore didn't even play in either of those games. So imagine he only caught eight total passes in those two games prior. I mean, chances are he's not going to do much better than that in this one, playing against a substantially better cornerback. So I look for Cam to utilize that short passing game like he has throughout the majority of the season, specifically targeting Christian McCaffrey to try and get the Saints linebackers moving horizontally as often as possible. McCaffrey did have 14 total receptions in the two games against the Saints, so it seems pretty likely to me that he's going to be a big part of the offense once again. Now, on the other side of the ball, it's all about the New Orleans running game, which ran all over this very good Carolina run defense in both games. I do expect that Carolina is going to keep this one much closer than the first two games, but if they can't slow down that Saints rushing attack, it is going to be another dominating New Orleans victory. I am taking the Saints in this one to move on to the divisional round. So let's move on to that divisional round and start talking about those games. The first one that we have is the New England Patriots, the number one seed against the Tennessee Titans. So if the Titans are able to get past the Chiefs, they do have that unenviable task of heading to Foxborough to face the defending Super Bowl champions and the top-seeded New England Patriots. We know that the Patriots do look vulnerable, especially defensively this season, but that offense is still as powerful as ever when they get clicking. With the likes of Chris Hogan and Rex Burkhead expected to be back for the divisional round, the Patriots will only be better after a week of rest. Tennessee should be proud of where they end up regardless of what happens this season. They made the playoffs. That was kind of surprising based on how they were looking at the middle of the point of the season, but I just don't see them being anything better than like a 10 point underdog in this game against the Patriots. I hate to say it, but that's just the way that I see this one playing out. That'll mean that the Patriots will move on to face the winner of the uh, other AFC divisional game, but that game will automatically take place in New England regardless of what happens in the other game. Now that other game is Jacksonville at Pittsburgh, the two seed against the three seed. Now, 
if this game does happen, I think it could be extremely interesting. On the surface, surface, it's hard to imagine that the Jaguars could keep up with the Steelers and their offense. And quite frankly, I just don't think that they can. But what they can do is exploit Ben Roethlisberger's gunslinger mentality. These teams faced off back in Week 5, and the Jaguars dominated that game. And they won despite Blake Bortles completing eight passes, total eight passes, for 95 yards, zero touchdowns, and an interception. But they still won that game by, like, what, 17 points, if I remember correctly? I mean, how they won is purely with defense and their ability to run the football. Leonard Fournette had a freaking monster game that day, something like 180 rushing yards. And in that game, the Jaguars forced Roethlisberger into countless uncomfortable situations. He ended up throwing five interceptions in that contest. They also shut down Le'Veon Bell, who touched the ball 25 times, including 10 catches, but he was only able to muster up 93 total yards on those 25 touches, and many of those catches came late in the game when the Jaguars were essentially playing prevent defense, and they were totally fine with Le'Veon Bell catching little four-yard passes out of the backfield. I get it. The Jaguars don't seem to be real. I mean, they just lost to the Titans for the second time this season. It's true. They're not impossible to beat by any means. But this defense is very, very good, and I think they have what it takes to beat the Steelers, and they've already proven that they can do it in blowout fashion in Pittsburgh. I am going to go against the grain on this one. I think that the Steelers will be the favorite if this matchup does happen, if all things stay the same as they currently are, but I will still take the Jaguars in this game. Heads up, I think that they are going to beat the Steelers for the second time this season. Now, on the NFC side, we have New Orleans at Philadelphia. Now, it's the top seed, Philadelphia Eagles, facing off against the number four seed, New Orleans Saints. But I actually think the four seed could be the favorite in this one. It's pretty rare to say that the top seed in what is believed to be the better conference is weak. But that's what I'm prepared to say right now about the Eagles. It's not just that they lost Carson Wentz. Uh, that didn't completely eliminate any possibility of them making a deep playoff run or anything. But it certainly feels like the wind was a little bit let out of the sails in Philadelphia. Nick Foles and the Eagles offense looked awful albeit limited work in a game that really didn't matter again to them against the Cowboys in Week 17, but zero points with an interception, not a good performance leading into the playoffs. Now, certainly we can't take that and say that it's going to be a repeat against New Orleans, but wow, I mean, that is not a good Cowboys defense, and this just doesn't look like an offense that's clicking at the moment. The carousel at running back has kind of kept all the backs relatively healthy, but it also doesn't really allow players like LeGarrette Blunt and Jay Ajayi, who typically have done well with heavier workloads throughout their career, to establish their kind of groove in their games. And I think that's going to be a problem against the Saints, who will almost certainly key in on slowing down the run in an effort to force Nick Foles to beat them. I know Philadelphia is the top seed in the NFC, but I've got to go with New Orleans in this one. They're probably the most balanced team of all the teams in the playoffs, and I just think they're going to figure out what works offensively and eventually lean on field positioning to pull ahead in this one and stay ahead, probably winning this one by a maybe six, seven points, somewhere in that range. So the other NFC playoff game that we have remaining here, Los Angeles at Minnesota. Now, with the New Orleans Saints winning, we know that the winner is of the Rams and Vikings game would automatically play the NFC championship game at home because this would be the two and the three seed playing against one another against the four seed. So the Vikings, perhaps the most balanced defense in the league, will have their hands full in this one against the Rams, who have been one of the best offenses throughout the regular season. Now, these teams did play not all that long ago in week 11, and the Vikings blew out the Rams at home by a final score of 24 to 7. This game will also be played at U.S. Bank Stadium, where the Vikings are 7-1 and this season. On that day, back in Week 11, Todd Gurley was held to just 37 rushing yards on 15 carries, and Jared Goff was held without a touchdown pass, despite the Rams being relatively healthy on offense. Xavier Rhodes will likely be matched up primarily with Sammy Watkins in this game, which does leave Cooper Cup and Robert Woods against some not-as-great secondary players, but the Vikings are pretty deep on their defense overall. So it's not like they're just going to be up against some scrubs. And I, I would say that Xavier Rhodes is essentially going to take away the deep passing game by locking down Sammy Watkins. So they would have to probably rely on Gurley and some of that short to intermediate passing game to attack the Minnesota defense. 
That didn't work all that well in the first game, and I'm really not sure that Sean McVay is going to be able to devise a scheme that's going to make up the 17-point gap that his team left on the field back in Week 11. The Vikings offense isn't particularly high powered, but they're definitely efficient and they don't turn the ball over all that much. So the Rams are going to have to put touchdowns on the board when they get into the red zone. They've been good at that this season. However, that was definitely a specialty of the Vikings defense who ranked third in the league in keeping their opponents from scoring well in the red zone. That red zone scoring defense percentage, third in the league for the Vikings. Very, very good. I like the Vikings in this one coming off of a bye and playing at home, but I do have to say the Rams were a surprising team this season. I would not be all that surprised if they were somehow able to squeak one out against the Vikings, but I am going to take Minnesota in this one. So that leaves us to our AFC and NFC Championship games. Final four teams remaining will be the Jacksonville Jaguars and the New England Patriots in the AFC, the New Orleans Saints and the Minnesota Vikings in the NFC. Now, on the AFC side, both of these teams, or I should say both of these games overall would be great, but the one that I would be excited for most, in my opinion, is the Jaguars and the uh, Patriots because, man, you think about that. Jaguars defense right now that's secondary and then you think about the greatest quarterback of all time Tom Brady and man that just sounds awesome I I really have to say I'm excited at the possibility of that game taking place this playoffs now Brady hasn't been his usual self down the stretch this season but the Patriots were still able to lock up the top seed in the AFC which means this game will be played in Foxborough and I think that's going to be a big advantage for the Patriots who are used to playing in some of those cold weather games it is freezing right now on the East Coast I don't know if it'll stay that way but could be a damn cold winter this year, it looks like. Now, the Jaguars might be built to play cold weather games with that defense and running game, but they haven't really been tested in many adverse weather conditions this season, so it'll be interesting to see how they make their adaptations to that cold weather. Now, it's easy to say that this game is going to be Brady versus Bortles, and obviously that's a Brady win, but I do think this game is still going to be very, very interesting, and it's not as simple as just quarterback versus quarterback. The Jaguars have no problem turning their games into an ugly war between the trenches, and in fact, I think that's what they'd prefer to do in a, in a game like this. Tom Brady is never one to shy away from a challenge, however, so I wouldn't be surprised if he came out and threw the ball 40 or more times even against this secondary. But if the Patriots are going to win this one, they're going to have to get some contributions from the likes of Rob Gronkowski, James White in the passing game, Rex Burkhead out of the backfield. These are the types of players, and obviously, you know, they're slot receivers as well, Chris Hogan potentially, uh, maybe even some Danny Amendola. Those type of players can cause physical mismatches for the defense, but they're often going to be matched up against some of those Jacksonville linebackers who are quick, but they've also been known to over-pursue at times. And uh, if they overcommit on stopping Deion Lewis in the running game, it could be play action over the top for days in this game. So uh, defensively, I would expect that Bill Belichick is going to focus on stopping that Jacksonville running game and Leonard Fournette. And we've seen them be successful uh, doing that in the past against other teams. We've also seen teams like the Titans be successful in shutting down Leonard Fournette in that running game and then just the Jaguars aren't able to do anything in the passing game so it becomes kind of a question on if Blake Bortles is capable of going on the road and putting his team on his back he wasn't able to do it against the Titans like I said in either of those games and I really wouldn't expect it here I've got the Patriots by about four or five points in this one somewhere in that range I think it's going to be a fairly close game but I do like Brady and the Pats to make it to the Super Bowl once again Now, New Orleans at Minnesota, that leaves us with this final game prior to the Super Bowl, the NFC Championship. If Minnesota were to win this game, they will end up playing four straight home games to end the season, including their Week 17 game against the Bears and the Super Bowl, which will also be played in Minneapolis. It's crazy to think how rare it's been throughout the history of the league, but it's only ever happened twice in the history of the NFL, Super Bowl 19 for the 49ers and Super Bowl 14 when the Rams hosted the Steelers. Oddly enough, neither of those teams actually played in their home stadium they were actually playing in nearby stadiums to their home stadium but in another building altogether so this would be a chance for the Vikings to make history and uh, I do have to say as a resident of the North Star State I have to admit that would be pretty damn cool to see the Vikings play in a Super Bowl although I'm not a Vikings fan myself Unfortunately, they have a tough challenge in hosting the Saints here. New Orleans is a completely different team than they've they've been in the past. Primarily focused on running ball, running the ball on offense, defending the pass on defense, but they're a tough out for really any opponent. Oh, 
Yeah, and they also have Drew Brees. Yeah, that guy, that future Hall of Famer. Michael Thomas and Xavier Rhodes would likely be the matchup to watch in this one in the passing game. But the real question is whether or not the Vikings could hold off this powerful Saints rushing attack. Minnesota's offense has been solid for most of the season, and they really don't make many mistakes. So I expect this to be a close game either way. Uh, the one thing that I will say is that the Saints historically play much better on the road indoors than they do uh, on the road outdoors. So they're still not the best road team or anything like that, but their offense seems to play better when they aren't dealing with the elements. So I do have to say that I'd be leaning slightly toward New Orleans in getting what would be considered, I guess, to be kind of an upset here over the Vikings on the road. Now, I'm not overly confident about this one. I just like the balance that New Orleans is bringing right now a little bit better than what the Vikings can do. Uh, you know, I, I hate to do this simple quarterback comparison, but Drew Brees and Case Keenum, I just don't think it's all that comparable at this point, to be honest with you. Um, you know, obviously the Vikings defense is better than New Orleans. I do have to say that, but I do think that New Orleans offense is substantially better as well. It's a strength versus strength type of thing here that we're talking about, and I just think that the Saints are slightly better balanced than Minnesota. But I do have to say, Minnesota is a roster that's built for longevity, so I wouldn't be surprised to see them back making another deep playoff run next season. So I'm going to take the Saints in this one, which gives us a Super Bowl 52 matchup of the New England Patriots versus the New Orleans Saints. And uh, man, the defending Super Bowl champion New England Patriots are back there again against the number four seed from the NFC, the Saints. Now, New Orleans, if they get here, will have knocked off the number one and number two seeds from the NFC in consecutive weeks. So I don't think they're going to be intimidated in facing the AFC's top playoff seed. And that narrative is, of course, going to be Brady versus Breeze, which is certainly one of the all-time great quarterback matchups in Super Bowl history. Maybe even the best matchup in Super Bowl history if you think about quarterback versus quarterback. But what's interesting is that both of these players are statistically having a bit of a down year as far as their usual statistics go. The Saints have transitioned, like we've talked about, into more of a run-first approach than we've ever imagined possible. And the Patriots are also leaning more heavily on the run than they have recently, but Brady has actually struggled a bit down the stretch as well. Well, still, this is going to be one of those monumental media extravaganzas if we get Brady versus Breeze, two future Hall of Fame quarterbacks battling for the league's top prize. Man, that would be friggin' crazy. And if you look at it statistically, there's almost no question that the Saints are substantially more balanced than the Patriots. New England's offense ranks best in the league in yards per game, but their defense is all the way down at 29th. Like, you're talking two extremes on either side. Meanwhile, the Saints have also been great on offense. They're second in the league on offense in ter terms of yards per game, only trailing the Patriots by three yards per game, but their defense is substantially better. They're kind of middle of the pack at 17th. The difference is that New England has been doing this kind of the same way for years. They know what works, they know how to exploit their opponent's weaknesses, and they know how to show up for big games. They've been doing it for a, more than a decade, 15 years at this point. It's ridiculous, honestly. It's like, this is just such a ridiculous stretch for a team. And New Orleans, despite having a Super Bowl win about a decade ago, they've been a perennial choke artist in the playoff for most of the Sean Payton era. And, uh, you know, you really have to look at it and say the Saints have some great young players on defense, but the Patriots are simply too deep. And they're too willing to spread the ball around for the Saints uh, to even really be able to key in on anybody. I mean, if you look at it like we got to shut down Rob Gronkowski, we've got to shut down uh, Brandon Cooks on the outside. Yeah, they could potentially do that, but the Patriots have proven that they're able to get the ball to those other players on their offense, and it's just so difficult to stop that offense. So I, I think this is going to be one of those games where it's going to be one of the highest scoring Super Bowls we've ever seen, and it could end up being one of the games that approaches like a 100-point total. But I truly believe that the Patriots would walk away with the Lombardi Trophy for the second straight season in this scenario, giving Tom Brady and Bill Belichick their record seventh Super Bowl championship, and further solidifying this as the greatest dynasty in professional football history. Got to give it to the Saints, though. Great season if they are able to make it to the Super Bowl. But again, Patriots, man, that dynasty is freaking ridiculous at this point. So I hope you guys enjoyed this preview video. If you did, make sure you drop a like on it, like I said, and subscribe to the channel if you are new. And let me know in the comments section below what you guys think about these predictions. If you agree with me, if you disagree with me, let me know in the comments section below. I'd be very interested to hear from you guys if I missed anything. And don't just say, my team's going to win, you're an idiot. Please give me a little bit more feedback than that. I made a 24-minute, 25-minute video for you guys, so uh, give me, you know, 30 seconds of your time to type up something that's a little bit more substantiated than just you're an idiot. My team's going to win. Please, let's talk. 
Thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Drop a like, subscribe if you're new, and I'll talk to you guys again soon.